Hello, everybody, and welcome to our latest Hubble Hangout. This is a place where you can learn about and discuss some of the science and discoveries of the Hubble Space Telescope. And today we've got a really good uh, topic today. We're going to be talking about the most important image ever taken, at least as far as, uh, in, my, in my opinion. Uh, we're going to be talking about the ultra deep field again and some enhancements and some ongoing evolution of the, of the image as it has progressed over the years. And um, we are going to go and uh, really delve deep into some of the latest, uh, some of the latest uh, wavelengths that have been added to the image as well. So. Uh, before I get started with the introductions, let me say that um, uh, you can interact with us, ask questions, uh, leave comments on uh, the Q&A app that we're broadcasting from on Google Plus and YouTube, as well as I'm uh, monitoring the, the Google Plus event page and uh, the uh, YouTube page as well. So, and there's also the Hubble hashtag or the Hubble Hangout hashtag on Twitter that I'm also following. So please say, uh, give us your questions and comments, and we'll have some time toward the end of the discussion to get to a lot of them. So I hope you guys will uh, will help us uh, get the discussion going at the, toward the end of the broadcast here. So my name is Tony Darnell. I work at the Space Telescope Science Institute, and I have been led here uh, in a very long and fortuitous and circuitous route, I guess, to the Institute by this very image, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, and we'll talk about that just a little bit. With me also is Dr. Carol Christian. She's my colleague at Space Telescope Science Institute. She will be uh, helping with the discussion, giving us great uh, insights, and also uh, a lot of history and background on the Ultra Deep Field. Also with me is Scott Lewis from Space Fan News and KnowTheCosmos.com. He's here to also provide his unique perspective with us. Uh, so today... That's you to describe it. It's a unique perspective. What? Yeah, <laughs> I, I definitely have a unique perspective, Tony. I know that's why you're here. So, <laughs> <laughs> so with me today is the uh, couple of members of the team who released the uh, the uh, ultra, ultra deep field, the latest one uh, image. Uh, with me is Dr. Harry Te Teplitz. He's a research scientist at Caltech. Um, he's also the science lead for NASA's infrared archive. So uh, welcome, guys, and uh, also Roger Windhorst. From he's a professor at Arizona State University, also a member of the team that put the uh, image that we're about to discuss out. So welcome, guys, and uh, finally, Dr. Anton Kokomer. He's also at the Space Telescope Science Institute, and more than anybody that I know, I think he and Carol, maybe Carol too, uh, have as much history with this particular image. Uh, he has been in many hangouts uh, discussing this and he's also a member of the Frontier Fields team which is sort of a, a, a an enhanced a, a, a sister project of the uh, Ultra Deep Fields because we talked about this last week Frontier Fields is going to try and take six more Ultra Deep Fields uh, in the in different areas of the sky so welcome Anton okay so let's let's start just a little bit with some um, with this particular image and Roger I'd like to start with you what was the motivation for, well, first of all, why don't you describe what you've done to the ultra deep field, and then we'll talk about some of the motivation for it. Well, I should begin to say that Harry led the, the team, and, and, and uh, Anton was the one who uh, probably first saw this image when it came out of his uh, beautiful Drizzle software. The thing that I added earlier this year is when I asked Harry uh, to have a copy of it, um, see, Harry and I were initially on competing teams, but we decided about two years ago to, to work together because this ultraviolet uh, imaging of Hubble is so important that, you know, the only way to get it done is get all the people together and, and, and do it. And so um, there were already, uh, let's see, nine filters that reached about the depth of 30th magnitude, which is very roughly uh, three fireflies as seen from the distance of the moon, but the moon not there for the moment. Um, and, and then I added these, these other filters in with proper weighting just for entertainment, for you know, just see what it would look like. And, and to my great surprise, it, it, you know, um, emphasizing the blue, blue colors properly, it was just out of this world and gave it back to Harry and Anton and then Zolt LeVay from the institute came in and he did his magic and um, I guess the rest is history but I just wanted to see what 841 orbits would look like uh, f for completely different reasons actually I was you know thinking about what it would do for the James Webb Space Telescope and and here you got it all 592 hours with these gorgeous colors and 
all these galaxies that are actively star forming they look blue as they should because they're producing all this ultraviolet light and uh, it's so, just gorgeous. I agree. I couldn't agree yeah. more. So, um, yeah. so Harry, welcome back. I'm glad I'm, you're all. Let me unmute you. There you go. Um, so we were, yeah. I, I I was gonna I would have started with you, but you went away, and now I I still yeah I don't know somehow it knew it knew that you were gonna come to me, and that's when it chose to disconnect. <laughs> so why don't you give us your your uh, take on on you know why why were you doing why did you do what you did with the ultra what was the, what was the rationale for it? Well, so uh, you probably said the ult Hubble Ultra Deep Field is the best view of distant galaxies in one small region of the sky ever taken. Um, it's an incredibly sensitive image of um, galaxies that are far away with nothing close by in the way to block our view. So it's a really good place to look. And Hubble has been studying it for uh, more than a decade now uh, and had previously concentrated on optical and near-infrared parts of the spectrum, optical meaning the light, the part of the spectrum that the eye can see, infrared being longer wavelengths, um, but what was missing was looking at the things that are bluer than the eye can see, which is the light that's produced by the youngest, most massive, hottest stars that are produced in distant galaxies. So by adding this uh, new wavelength regime, we are able to study um, distant galaxies that are actively forming stars and uh, in a special... Uh, in a particular time period. So if you think about ultraviolet light that's produced in distant galaxies by young stars, NASA has spent a lot of effort studying that in local galaxies using both Hubble and some other satellites like the Galaxy Evolution Explorer. And we've seen that light with Hubble in very distant galaxies in the Hubble Ultra Deep Field because the expansion of the universe and the Doppler shift means that we observe that light at longer wavelengths so that the the visible and near-infrared pictures show us that light in the most distant galaxies. But in between, there was a gap from galaxies that were emitting light 5 to 10 billion years ago. If we wanted to see the ultraviolet light, we had to use the ultraviolet capability of Hubble that's only come online with the most recent surfacing mission. And so filling in that gap tells us a lot about the study of galaxy evolution in this very great field. Uh, which, so in those the, in, in that wavelength regime, what were the general uh, ages of the galaxies that were in there? Like you know the you said you know the, the infrared shows the most distant galaxies, the ones the, the ones right, furthest so back. So it, what is the what does the UV regime get us? What what range of? If you think about metaphorically, if you think about studying galaxies as like studying people, when you use Hubble's infrared, you see things that are essentially baby galaxies. You see galaxies in the very distant universe within a billion years of their formation. And when you study galaxies in the ultraviolet locally, you are seeing grown-up galaxies. But in between 5 to 10 billion years ago, you had galaxies that were in the process of growing up, so sort of teenage galaxies. So they were a few billion years old at that time, but they weren't finished evolving into galaxies that like we see today. Awesome. So uh, Scott has a good uh, slide up now that sort of answers the question why was the UV important and uh, so as, as it says there you can see get an idea of, of sort of where in the wavelength range we're talking about. Um, also I'm going to put up a quick uh, graphic too that shows what instruments were used um, with uh, with to make this observation. So here are all of the different uh, detectors that are in the, Hub or the Hubble Space Telescope's uh, image plane. And you can see that the wide field camera 3 is right in the center. Uh, there's also the advanced camera for surveys in there. Uh, you can see where NICMOS and STIS and you know, COS, all of the different areas of the uh, image plane where these uh, detectors are. But off to the right the, oh, is it overlapping with C3, Carol? There's UVIS 1 and 2. Right. So yeah, that, I, could, yeah. I could say a word or two about that. Yes. Um, okay, so, go ahead. Can I, sure. can I just, before Anton says something, so what, what you're l looking at in that graphic is imagine that you had a very large lens and you had a camera back on it. 
that's what we have. But our camera back has several different kinds of cameras on it. So it's as if you had several little cameras all stuck together and one big lens. So that, yeah. that's what you're looking at. You're looking at all of those cameras and imagine that the telescope is coming straight out of the screen at you. Um, and so the, the idea is the light comes into the mirror, um, it bounces back to what's called a secondary mirror, and then it comes down where all these cameras are. And all that light gets collected. So instead of being collected by just one camera like your home camera does, we have the ability to use all different kinds of cameras to look at different kinds of light. And Anton's going to explain about the Widefield Camera 3, which was installed in 2009. Okay, go ahead, Anton. Okay, sure. Uh, so what you're looking at, as Carol said, is basically you've, you've got these different cameras. Each one is like one of the cameras that you normally use at home. Uh, they, in fact, have about the same number of megapixels. These are basically 16 megapixel cameras for the, the UV that we're talking about today. Um, Tony was asking why these are on top of each other. Basically, this instrument can let you look at either infrared light or UV light, uh, just not at the same time. And so there's a little mirror inside there which switches between the two. Or well, in fact, it's a prism. Um, so you can choose to look on the sky either in ultraviolet, which is what we're talking about today, or in infrared. Uh, in fact, a, a neat thing about the ultra deep field, uh, so Tony was mentioning that, that it brought him into this field a while ago. It's actually 10 years uh, this year that we've been looking at this field. Uh, 10 years ago is when we did the original ultra deep field release with the advanced camera for surveys. That's a camera that's slightly off center there. Yep. Um, and that's deep optical, basically. That's things like red, green, and blue wavelengths. Um, a few years ago, you might remember a hangout we did a year or two ago for the infrared ultra deep field. And that's also in the central part of the wide field camera three, but that's the infrared. And so that let us see all of the, basically the, the longer wavelength emission from galaxies. And so today we're going to the other extreme. Today we're going to the ultraviolet. And so we're really adding the, the final missing piece for this uh, ultra deep field. Um, today really is the first time that we've got complete wavelength coverage across this field. It's taken us about 10 years to build up and about 600 hours worth of exposure time. So it's a long time. So, Carol, uh, he brings up a good point. Ten years was when the first observations were taken in this area of sky. And even before that, there was another deep field. It was just called regular old deep field. That, that was regular old deep field, right. <laughs> yes. That was, it. that was about 20 years ago. Or, no, that was 96, right? I think, right? They took that one. So, uh, but that was in a different area of the sky, uh, different instruments, and uh, wasn't as deep as I understand that the uh, ultra deep field was. So. One thing about astronomy that you can do with images and telescopes is that when you keep staring at the same part of the sky over and over and over again, and you can add all of that up, and they will stack up, uh, and each one really does add to the other. Um, uh, there's, that's one of the really cool things about astronomical imaging. In fact, what you don't want to do is open up your camera and stare at one part of the sky for, you know, hours and hours because the detector will have a lot of noise in it and, and it gets it gets uh, uh, it's not as ideal. What you want are a whole bunch as short as possible exposures and then when you add them up the signal adds up linearly with each one that you add but the noise only adds up as a square root of the number of those. And the reason I say that is that that is that we, we take advantage of uh, that in astronomy to make some images that we would not be able to see Otherwise, now there are, there are limits to this, but and and Frontier Fields has found a very clever way around uh, the limitations of the Hubble by using gravity lens, gravitational lenses to boost signal. This this is one way in which we've done it, and we've been looking at this area of the sky now for, as Anton said, ten years. So would you guys say this is the most studied area of deep space? Mm -hmm. For the yeah. purpose of this kind of study, that's true. There are other very interesting questions you can ask that are studying uh, different things. So, you know, this doesn't tell us anything about our galaxy. We see, the great thing about this is our galaxy is not in the way. Uh, right, so we can we can see things, uh, we can see, as you were pointing out, with the different wavelength ranges and the different distances with which we can see, we, we can also see galaxies in various parts of their evolution. Now, I'm sh I'll put up this graphic of the ultra deep field where it is. This is the area of the sky. It's in the constellation near Fornax. Uh, it is uh, 
a rather unremarkable area. I mean, when you look there with the telescope, you don't see much. But Carol, what's the what's the how big of a piece of the sky is this that we're what we're talking about here? Well, it, Anton probably knows the analogy, but it's a very very small um, piece of the sky. Anton, you can t probably tell yeah, me sure. exactly how. Oh, do you have an analogy? Is a good analogy. <laughs> the easiest way is, is when you look at the moon, this is about one-tenth the diameter of the moon. So some of those larger craters on the moon maybe that are ten times Something the width like of the that. moon, this would basically fit in one of those craters if you were to just look at it. That's a good analogy. Yeah. So the well, point is that it's a very small part of the sky, and so a lot can be learned. And, and Harry actually talked about it a little bit, is that when he was describing the different kinds of nearby galaxies, the baby galaxies, and in between. And so we do tend to look at stuff nearby because we can see it, resolve it, look at it in detail. But we're always interested in looking at the baby galaxies because we want to know what happened in the beginning. But we have to link those together. Like what was going on in the early universe that produced these beautiful spiral galaxies, these lovely elliptical galaxies, or these tiny little dwarf galaxies that we see today. So it's important to look at all different times to understand what was going on, how fast the stars were forming, where the gas and dust went. And so that's why the, the ultraviolet was important in this particular field because we knew a lot about a, a few nearby galaxies, but mostly distant galaxies, and you want to, to bridge that timeline. You know, it's like your Facebook timeline. You only have the beginning and the end. You need the, the in-between. And so adding to the observations, and I will also say that in addition to HST, the thing about the deep fields is that other observatories are used to look at different aspects of these deep fields as well, which adds to our knowledge in general. Yeah, I think that's a very good point, that the Chandra X-ray Observatory and the Spitzer Space Telescope that looks in the infrared and the Herschel Observatory have all looked their deepest images here, too. Right. And what do what uh, what did uh, what did Chandra see? Chandra saw well, Anton, you you've been working on this, but a good number of active nuclei in the X-rays, right? <clears throat> Weak ones in particular. So they yeah. would have seen a bunch of very bright X-ray sources that would have probably been the centers of those galaxies. Exactly. Uh, so Chandra has, in fact, spent almost 10 million seconds of integration time in the field now. And so you've got this really great legacy field. Uh, Spitzer has also spent a lot of time. And when you look at the Chandra image... Uh, Wait you, a minute, did you say 10 field? billion seconds on this field? Exactly, yeah. So 4 million... So in five times longer than Hubble, right? I uh, did not know that. I did it's not been know extended, that. so it's busy, it's busy accumulating as we speak. Um, the initial wow. 1 or 2 million seconds showed us, as Roger said, all the active galaxies. Basically, every time you have a black hole, you have gas, when you throw gas around a black hole, it heats up and it gives off x-rays. And you can see that with Chandra. And so the first couple of million seconds, every little optical galaxy you see with Hubble, if there's a black hole at the center of it that's active, you'd see that in the, in the x-ray. So the Chandra image, all the black holes light up, basically. As we go deeper with Chandra, you start seeing x-rays from other things. Um, our sun gives off x-rays. If you look at our sun in x-ray wavelengths, you see that. And so normal stars, or or certain types of stars can give off x-rays. Um, supernova remnants, when a star explodes, that gives off x-rays too. So as we go deeper with Chandra, we begin to see more and more x-rays, not just from the active galaxies with black holes, but actually from the normal galaxies. And so ultimately, in this ultra-deep field Hubble image, many of the galaxies that, that we would call normal are actually also showing up now in Chandra. They basically, we're going deep enough with Chandra to show very sensitive X-ray emission from the exploding stars and other things in these galaxies. So it's a very nice complementary data set. It's actually, I think, unique in astronomy that you go this deep with so many different wavelengths. I have a question about that then. It, have there been many beautiful composite images of Chandra and Spitzer and Hubble? Have we been able to put together of all these different observatories into like the the ultimate ultra deep field? We, with all that data, I mean, that's, you know, 10 million seconds of observation, I think, would really be great to help supplement to even give a more beautiful image coming out there. Is that well, that's, it's, it's a good idea. Uh, they have different resolutions. That's one thing that, that, would, uh, that you notice first when you do that, that kind of comparison. Right. Um, in fact, 10 years ago, I did a, a, an image like that uh, when, when I found 
certain types of galaxies that you didn't see in the optical at all with Hubble. You only saw them in Chandra and Spitzer. But we looked at Hubble as well. And so when you make a composite image like that, you discover that the Hubble, the amount of detail you see with Hubble is so sharp compared to um, Chandra and also Spitzer that a detailed galaxy with Hubble comes up basically as a sort of a fuzzy blob maybe with Chandra or with Spitzer. So what you have is a detailed Hubble image with then fuzzy blobs from the X-ray and the IR uh, from Spitzer. And so, yeah, you can do it, uh, but they have very different when, resolutions. Let me make look a at it. Sorry, let me make a comment on that too. What Anton said is right. You, you're seeing different things, different resolutions. Another thing to remember from X-rays all the way to radio, where the Hubble Ultra Deep Field has been observed with Chandra and, and Spitzer and the very large array and telescopes in Australia. It's almost 20 orders of magnitude of wavelength. It's sort of you know sitting in front of your Comcast TV and flipping through all 10,000 channels, uh, only maybe 10 channels of which show the stellar population and the rest shows other things, which are relevant but still different. And when you combine them, you'd have to really think hard before it makes sense. But so the context of the different you see the stars from blue to red everywhere. Okay. Yeah, that makes I sense. I think it's important to remember that we're talking really about the exception, though, of pictures that combine Chandra, Spitzer, and Hubble. If you look at things that are close by, your the original question is exactly right. You get really incredible images if you look at nearby galaxies. Just uh, last week, Hubble and Chandra released a spectacular image of the Whirlpool galaxy. It does exactly what you say. It shows you the X-ray light and the optical light on the same scale. And it's really uh, quite spectacular. That's beautiful. Let me point out another thing, Tony, that's important for folks to realize. When okay. you have a telescope like Hubble, and you go for 10 years, you know, you spend a week, a year, or some number like that to look at that same field, and you go deeper and deeper and deeper. The deeper you go, it is not necessarily true that you actually look at earlier epochs, or what we call astronomers, higher redshifts. Um, you just begin to look at fainter, intrinsically fainter objects, and that's because of a conspiracy between the amount of volume that's available in the cosmos in the early days. At higher redshift, the universe is smaller, and therefore there is less volume you look at, so there's fewer galaxies. And most of the star formation happens when the universe was about half the current age. So with the current ultraviolet rendering, when you go deeper and deeper, you begin to pick up all these relatively faint, you know, halfway to the edge of the universe galaxies that we see. I liken it a little bit to um, the cosmic stock market, if you wish. If you look at Wall Street, there is, you know, IBM's and Microsoft's and then very small cap companies. In the cosmic stock market, there is all these tiny galaxies that do most of the star forming power. And there's, in fact, very few of those giants. And so what we do at the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, you look deeper and deeper into these small cap companies, if you wish, that <laughs> do the collective cosmic star formation. And I want people to realize that. And that's why the image looks blue as it should, because you see all this ultraviolet light from these galaxies that are not all that far away, maybe halfway between here and the Big Bang. Yeah, let me let me put it up real quick. So I'm going to run this little uh, this little animation here that we put out in the press release. So it starts by showing where in the sky we are. There's the constellations and the general area in which we're we're looking, and it sort of zooms way in, and we're getting past the stars in our galaxy and going ever deeper and looking at this little tiny patch of sky that Carol was and Anton were telling us about, and here it is. So this is the, the image that was released, uh, and as you can see, there's a lot of blue in there, an awful lot of, uh, you know, a lot of galaxies, and <laughs> 10,000 in this picture. Every single dot, smudge, and smear, with the exception of a few uh, foreground stars, is an entire galaxy. And I don't care how many times I look at that, uh, it just... It's it's incredibly humbling, and and I, I I can't help but get emotional over it. This this image, I'm not overstating it when I say this image has changed my life. I mean, it really really has. And Anton's heard me say this before in all the <laughs> hangouts we've done because <laughs> he always is in the hangouts where I'm doing this. But it's like that, that that's just it's just stunning. The kind I mean, every, when I posted this on <laughs> Twitter, uh, it. It went crazy. Scott did a video on it, and it, it blew up. I mean, it just everybody loves uh, this this image, and so um, I don't know. It just 
Okay, so I'm going to get back to the science. <laughs> so it's no, all good. <laughs> um, I want to. Uh, Roger said something very, uh, very um, interesting about the the small galaxies having a big important role in star formation, um, star and cluster formation and production. I remember, um, and this is not my field of expertise, but it seemed to me, you know, being in a different field, subfield of astronomy, that when we first did the deep fields and we did the Hubble deep field, that there was a lot of emphasis on merging, of understanding mergers and how galaxies came together and they built bigger and bigger galaxies and then we saw those today. And over time, now it does seem like it's becoming more and more important to understand what the little galaxies are doing because they, in fact, may be where a lot of the production is. And I think that's interesting in the history of deep fields that sort of the emphasis on what we're thinking about as far as star formation and where stars and galaxies come from has changed a little bit because of these types of observations. Yeah, indeed, Carol. The, the 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 power of cosmic star formation is is to the little galaxy guy in the street, so to speak. Right? It is it is these tiny things that they're doing it collectively. Yeah, they do merge and they do grow bigger galaxies over time. Like you know, companies on Wall Street become eventually <laughs> Microsofts and IBMs. But there's very few of those, even in the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. If you look at these big giant red galaxies, the giant ellipticals. There's not too many of those, and those are the end, end products of the mergers that happened actually fairly long time ago. Yeah, there's a, I think one of the largest galaxies in the universe, I see 1101 is elliptical, and it came from just all these merging. In fact, when the Milky Way and uh, the Andromeda galaxy uh, collide, they will form uh, a, an elliptical galaxy too. So yeah, these are, you don't see too many of those, but uh, uh, th we just did a press release today on dwarf galaxies, right Carol, where there was uh, they were talking about the the rapid rate of star formation. Yes, so it's another it's a different observation, but yes, a different observation, but but, yeah. it, but it was along the same theme, and and it just seems to me I'm seeing more and more uh, science papers about this is that these small galaxies, um, when they're studied in detail, is that they they are having a more important role um, in in the formation of stars and then subsequently the formation of galaxies. So sometimes what we may be looking at, the, the galaxies we see today that are uh, closer to us, may have come from um, several of these kinds of smaller galaxies that have very rapid energetic star formation. And so it becomes an interesting puzzle to try to forensically disentangle that. Yeah. Um, and, and there is sometimes is evidence that there was more than one object that that uh, formed the thing that we would see today. And I think that, it, that the two results, that's an important uh, thing that Hubble offers, right, is that Hubble has a couple of different ways to study these very small objects. The thing we're looking at in the picture that's on the screen now is the, you know, the point which we were making was the UV, uh, the ultraviolet light. The, the press release today is actually about looking at it in the infrared, even though it's very similar sources. Yes, yes. Uh, but the, the key point there was what Carol was mentioning about how these dwarf galaxies are probably responsible for the vast majority or, or a large proportion of the star birth that's good that we see uh, or the stars that are in the universe. So uh, uh, I think the way we phrase it today is it, it's more than their fair share. More than their fair share. So here we have the deep field. This is what we see when we stare at a patch of sky where nothing seems to be. Uh, what are your opinions on how ubiquitous this is, and Anton's working on Frontier Fields, which is a project that's designed to try help answer this question, but I wanted to open the discussion up to you guys. Is this common, do you think, or uh, are we going to, is, is it going to be very different if you look somewhere else? This is common. The, one of the basic uh, fundamental assumptions in astronomy that has been borne out through all kinds of tests is that there are no special directions in the universe. There are special directions in our galaxy, but we're not looking at our galaxy here. The universe is very similar overall on the largest scales. So well, if, you can find, uh, if you can find something where you can look far away, it should look in a gross scale like this. But the when you see things like the cosmic web, those animations where the, there's these tendrils of galaxies on the large scale structure of the universe, that sort of tells me that you can you could probably get to a spot where there isn't a whole lot of galaxies. It would be different. But, but different that areas. web is 
this picture that we're looking at is very small when you compare it to the moon, but it goes very, very far. So if you think of a pencil, the web is a slice, through, or if you think of a tree, right? A tree is very tall and thin. If you slice a tree, you'll see rings, and maybe even those rings could be different at different spots along the tree. But the cosmic web is like a slice, whereas this picture goes all the way up the tree. So if you average out all the way along, the average is the same, even though in detail along the way there might be denser and less dense regions. Right. But if you look there's back indeed, 10 billion years... There's yeah, Scott's got a picture of it there. There's indeed a few clumps here and there, as Harry says, but the average is is pretty average. And, and we looked at that a couple of years ago for adjacent fields um, in the greater goods area and compared to other even larger fields done from the ground. And we find that on average the, the count, the number of galaxies, is um, no more off than about 20, 30 percent in the Hubble Ultra Deep Field compared to what you observe on average, which is pretty good. That's not to say that you can't find a redshift or cosmic epoch slice where there is bigger than average pileup. I'd say a good word for this field is that it's representative. Uh, it basically shows you a, a typical slice of the universe. Now, when you look at it, you actually see the galaxies are not completely even across it, right? You, I mean, there are some spots where you have more galaxies and some where you have less. And uh, basically, what you're looking at is you're looking through this cosmic web. You, you're sort of seeing superpositions of all the different clusters of galaxies on top of each other. Uh, but in general, it's, it's a fairly uniform field once you average it out. That's even it's even more mind-boggling to think about that. I mean, you kind of hope that it would be a strange, special situation, but now you know you've got galaxies all over. Uh, so I always use the hundred billion rule. What do, you want, what do you guys think about that? There's about a hundred billion galaxies in the universe, each with about a hundred billion stars. Is that a really is that is that that's too simplistic? That's what I always tell people. We had a question like that on Twitter last year, on last week. When you include all those dwarf galaxies, um, I would call it closer to a trillion. A trillion. Um, you used to be able to say that there is about as many galaxies in the universe as dollars in the national debt. It's not quite too many more. <laughs> the number of galaxies is still roughly the same. That's um, pressing on a different level. Praise so the Lord. Uh, the universe is going to have to go to war a little bit more to get it right. back up and, there. And, and the number of stars in a giant galaxy, like these big red beasts in the image, is also about almost a trillion. Okay. And then, of course, the tinier galaxies have far fewer, maybe only. 10 or 100 million stars. Okay, so that's a gross simplification then. It sounds like I have yeah. to start giving a different answer. You want to state it differently. There is about as, as many stars in the universe in all these galaxies if you multiply the trillion by the 100 billion as there is uh, atoms in what we call a mole, Avogadro's number. And that's yeah. a good yeah. number to keep them out. About a 10 with 23 zeros. Wow. Yeah. Nice and so, so I wanted to mention something else. I mean, there is yeah. the thing about is this representative? We do have different kinds of data, like the cosmic um, microwave background, which suggests that when this all started, it was more or less uniform. So we do. I mean, we do very, have very, a, very uniform. I, 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 we have other expectations from other data that. If this was unique, then something really weird must have happened between that epoch and when the the the, the first galaxy formed. And we still don't totally understand that process. But if we're we're somehow cleverly picking out the special place in the universe to look at with Hubble Space Telescope, it's very unusual because other data suggests that that's not the case. In addition to the ground-based optical infrared data, X-ray data that people have collected. That's true. Yeah, that's true. They, there's an awful lot of other representative data too. So, Roger, I, I want to. I'm going to preempt you, Tony. Sorry. Okay, go ahead. I want to ask Roger about okay. like dark matter and dark energy. What does, the, looking at this, you know, you're mapping out where the galaxies came from, where the, the you know, middle-aged or the teenage galaxies are. Does that tell us anything about dark, dark energy, dark matter, any of that stuff? Sorry, yeah. Tony. No, that's a good question. I, I, would, I was going to get there eventually. Good. Yeah, those are very good questions. Of course, only about 4% of what we know must exist in the universe is, is inside atoms and, and stars and, and matter that we can eventually see, although even all of that doesn't glow either. 
The other 96% is very roughly divided in, in a third uh, dark matter and two-thirds dark energy. And, and those affect how much gravity there is for the dark matter in any specific region and how much curvature of space there is as far as the dark energy is concerned and how, how the expansion evolves as a function of, of time. And, and all of this you can measure uh, somewhat with galaxies. There are actually better yardsticks to do this, as you well know, like the supernovae inside these galaxies, some of which have actually been found in this Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And, and um, so as far as dark energy is concerned, images like this and also future images at even uh, higher redshift with the James Webb Space Telescope will really help us to nail down this dark energy. Having said that, dark energy is such a global phenomenon that you actually must measure it over a much larger scale. And so NASA is now designing future missions such as WFIRST to right. do just that. That's right. Yeah. So you, you brought up... Um, you brought up JWST, and, and one of the reasons, one of your motivations for looking at this image, or, or for taking this particular deep field uh, that you've just released, was so that you could learn or get an idea about what to expect with JWST. What did you learn in that in that respect? Well, my main interest of looking at this image, other than, of course, the great science that Harry and company have pioneered with the ultraviolet, is to see if you would add all the images together, if you would eventually come to a limit where you can't go any deeper because the galaxies start overlapping. It's sort of a little bit, you can't see the forest for the trees anymore. And we're not quite there yet, but a little bit more of that will happen with the James Webb Space Telescope. Now, the James Webb is a six and a half meter telescope, so it's more than two and a half times bigger than Hubble, which means it, the infrared wavelengths, the further infrared wavelengths, even redder than red, um, that it will operate, it will have the same resolution as Hubble and at the bluer wavelengths, as blue as the eye can see almost, uh, visual wavelengths, it will actually have better resolution than Hubble. But it's primarily designed as an infrared telescope that will be launched in the fall of 2018 to look even further into space, earlier epochs, what we say call larger redshifts, earlier cosmic times where the universe was so small that the light has been stretched so far since it arrived from there to us. Um, that we must use infrared wavelengths to actually see these objects. So if you ask where is the very first galaxies, those would not be seen in this image, not in very large numbers anyway. There's maybe one or two candidates, but we expect there to be hundreds or even more, but that will require the James Webb. Yeah, that's true. Well, there's a lot of anticipation for being able to see these very first galaxies uh, right up. I mean, the very just the very first ones that were that have ever formed. Uh, JWST is expected to see. But you said something I'm a little confused about. And Scott and I were talking about this last night. How it, I I know that James Webb is primarily an infrared telescope, but the you said it could go out to the blue wavelengths. Well, it can go to visual about six thousand angstroms or or, or seven. Okay, but not quite the UV, the UV right? Band, not blue. I, okay. I lazily called it blue. I really mean visual. So okay. the unique part of Hubble is the ultraviolet and the real blue, what we perceive as blue. What we perceive as orange, yellow, uh, that James Webb can just do. And then anything longwards of that by about a factor of 100. So it typically runs from um, 6,000 angstroms, which is orange, into the mid-infrared, about 29th. Um, okay. Uh, my yeah, I, I'm trying to find I think you're going to get a kind of quick visual of that. If, if Scott can look at the one of the last pages in the slides I sent, there's a, a red and a blue comparison where you see that, that this, again, Roger made two different versions of the picture. Um, yeah. One that emphasizes what James right. Webb will see versus one that shows the full range of Hubble. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah, thanks, Harry. I was just about to show that. Yeah, please do show that. And okay. All right, so yeah, Scott, Scott will be getting that up soon. I have so, them on my screen, Tony. If you can show my screen, well, um, you'll have to do it. So the way you'll have to put, you'll have to press yeah. the screen share button. I think he's got oh, it. He's got it. He's got it there. Okay. Okay. So, what? Go ahead and describe what we're looking at. Eight hundred and forty-one orbits. Yeah. So the the. Um, Red rendered, there's two versions. There's a red rendered image, which is not a whole lot different from what you've seen before, except I stretched the red a little harder. And that shows all the current Hubble data with this particular emphasis on anything longwards of the orange, which is pr pretty much what James Webb will see. And you can see the galaxies are very densely packed because A, they have lots of older stars in their outskirts, which 
cause all this you know orangey reddish reddish glow of light and then if you look at the blue rendering of the same data but where now the ultraviolet blue was emphasized as it should be um, for the you know most of cosmic time the one that that uh, Harry Taplitz et al released uh, two weeks ago that image it's the same data but completely different rendered and, and differently rendered and that's what Hubble now has seen and the contrast between the two, if you can toggle the back and forth, really will, will give you a sense of what James Webb will see compared to what Hubble has now done. Yeah. And so I think if you look at the image, it's in, and I think maybe we're still seeing pictures of us, not the image, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah. No, we're... Um, in, in any event, the, the thing about the blue one is when you look at the blue picture, that's something Hubble can do, but after Hubble, that capability is not going to be accessible for a while. Yeah. So it's a, it, we're, we're in a sort of last chance to see situation with the ultraviolet. Yeah, so you can see there's a lot more stars in any given area on the right image than from the left. And so um, I have always said that, you know, the future of astronomy, I just sort of, you know, when, when I when I'm feeling uh, glib, I'll go, the future of astronomy is in the infrared. And, the, you know, the reason I always say that is that's where that's an area of the the uh, spectrum that we've only recently had good detectors for things like these new infrared Merced tel uh, uh, CCDs, things like that that can that are actually sensitive to these wavelengths without being too noisy. And so, um, but I wanted to ask you about the UV. The UV seems very under. Utilize, or at least not as it's not as much as infrared for reasons that I think you know most people can understand. But what kind of science is most? I mean, and I know you talked about looking at galaxy formation. Is there any other kind of science that UV astronomy or the UV wavelengths are, are pretty good at, are good for? Uh, another thing that Hubble does is it can take not only pictures in the UV, but it can um, study spectra of the light, meaning that breaking it down by wavelength. Um, and with that, we can, that's how we know about this cosmic web that you're talking about, uh, that you talked about earlier. Right. That by studying things that emit at only particular wavelengths or things that absorb only a particular wavelengths, we can understand a huge amount of the detailed physics of um, what, not only what are the stars doing, but what's in the way of the stars. So what is the gas doing where the gas might absorb something, and that gas is an outflow from the galaxy, or um, what is the dust doing? Because where you don't see the UV is often important because it means that there could be dust or gas in the way. Okay, so I want to get. I, I want to. We're starting to run out of time, and I want to make sure we get to some of the uh, uh, questions that I that we're getting on uh, Twitter. Uh, from Libby Doodle, at Libby Doodle, is asking, JWST will be two and a half times bigger, uh, greater than two and a half times bigger than Hubble. It will look even further into space. Is there a limit to how far we can see? Uh, who wants to take that one? Sorry. I, I think the simple answer to that is, yes, there's a limit, because the universe, uh, we know that the universe started 13 and some billion years ago, so that's as far back as you can see. And in fact, um, even though you might not be able to take a picture that far back with James Webb, you, the cosmic microwave background that we mentioned earlier is a picture of as far back as you can see. And that's something that's studied with, for example, the Planck uh, mission that has um, recently taken what they call the best picture of the universe ever. Yeah, yeah. I guess a lot of that is, a lot of it is, the answer to that question is this wavelength dependent. Uh, microwaves can see the further, that we, they give us the, the uh, absolute limit to how far we can see, uh, but did other wavelengths uh, give us different, different areas as far as uh, distance from, from the uh, Earth. She's also yeah. asking, uh, is, uh, have we ever come cosmic time, uh, Tony, oh, it, it becomes ahead. a little easier. So the, the time after the Big Bang, it takes presumably a couple of hundred million years for the first stars to form. The, this means you're from the Earth's Hubble's perspective, you're now looking so far back in time uh, that all the light from the f or first stars is redshifted to the mid-infrared and that's why you need James Webb. And, and so the first few hundred million years is what Webb can do. Um, Hubble really runs out of steam at around 450, 500 million years. 
And so the first few hundred million years before that is what you need a web for. And if stars formed even earlier than that, um, you'd have to think about something next. And at some point you get into the dark ages where there's nothing there and then you have to start using radio telescopes because the yeah. only gas that shines is hydrogen, which is well seen in the radio wavelengths. Right, and I mean, we we managed to cheat the system a little bit with frontier fields by getting some gravity, you know, some help from uh, galaxy clusters between us and Hubble to kind of boost the signal a little bit. But you're right; I mean, we're we're reaching the we're definitely at the limit to where where Hubble can see now. Yeah. So um, to add to that, I mean, so basically, it's not so much a question of how of losing galaxies because they're faint, but I mean, you do lose them too. But the main issue is that the light shifts out of our observed band right. passes. And so the further back in time we look, the higher the redshift, let's say, so the galaxies look redder and redder. So, yeah, I mean, Hubble can only see galaxies up to a certain distance back in time, effectively. Uh, and after that, they redshifted so much that they go to James Webb. And in the James Webb, you can also see only up to a certain limit. And the question at this point is, are we going to reach the limit of James Webb uh, before we reach the, the very first stars that are formed? Or are those first stars formed so early that even James Webb isn't long enough wavelength to see them? Um, chances are it's probably the, the former. Probably the, the stars are forming at a time that James Webb can see them. But right. basically that's your limit. It's sort of not sort of much a question of how far you can look, but really how deep back in time you can see them. Yeah, and, and the reason I'm glad we're talking about this now is that also addresses a tweet that I did not get to last week from Scott. He's at Chaos020. When he asked the question, what is the maximum zoom of the space telescope? And Anton gave a really uh, concise answer right there. It's not so much, you know, zooming in as it is how far back one can see in, in, in time for these different... Uh, there's, a good, there's a good question to that. It's just like a standard... Uh, megapixel camera that doesn't have any zoom on it. Uh, basically, your zoom is how much you blow the images up by. Um, uh, Hubble has a really long focal length, so if you think of it in terms of, of a focal length zoom lens, uh, it's longer than your typical uh, telephoto lens. Uh, but when we take these images, uh, when we zoom in on them, usually we expand them on in digital form. So it's, it's, each camera just has a fixed zoom. We can't actually change magnification of the zoom on the cameras themselves. Yeah, I, I guess it depends on what you mean by zoom. I guess, so you're right. I mean, you can blow up major, just make it larger, and that's a form of, of zoom. So um, so we have some comments here. Craig Landon is commenting. I don't have the ability to highlight these questions. This is from the uh, Q&A app. Um, it goes, so for the Hubble Ultra, Super Ultra Mega Deep Field Image, how much correction has to be done to allow for we haven't gotten ultra mega yet. That's a good one. We need to do that. Um, that how much the next KCD correction probably. has been done to allow for distances across the image over the course of ten plus years? How That's much a very correction? good question. Uh, so, 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 some things do move. Now, galaxies are so far away that over ten years, the galaxy will still be in the same spot in the sky. But as as Roger and Harry mentioned earlier, we are looking through our galaxy. And this image does have a few stars in it that are from our galaxy, actually. They're foreground stars. Basically, anything with a little plus-shaped cross around it is one of the stars in our galaxy. And guess what? They move. Over the course of 10 years, they actually move by enough to upset things. So when I make these images, when I made... Actually, I made the first one in 2004, and so it's sort of come full circle from it. Um, every time I combine these, I, I have scripts that align the images based on whatever's in them. And in standard astronomy, you align based on the stars, because stars are nice and sharp, and you can get a good centroiding on them. Well, for the ultra-deep field, that's not a good idea, because the stars move, and so they actually <laughs> upset the alignment. Um, so when I do my registration, when I combine new images, especially these new ultraviolet ones, with the original ones from 2004, um, I actually have to discard all the stars, because many of them move by so much that they throw the registration off. Uh, but the galaxies themselves, they do move a lot. Of course, the stars, I mean, we're orbiting in our Milky Way around the center. But they're so far away, these galaxies, that we don't see any of that movement in the time scale of the 10 years that we're looking at. Uh, and same for the galaxy's evolution, too. Ultimately, galaxies change how they look over the course of the universe. Uh, you, you see them merging and evolving. Um, but 10 years is not enough time to see that either. And so 
to all intents and purposes, the galaxies in the ultra deep field today look the same as they did ten years ago. But the stars. Well, we do like, what we can see. Um, Change variable phenomenon though in these images, and in fact, Roger, you mentioned a supernova. So those are sometimes we pick those up in these deep fields. That's it's right. Supernovae and variable AGM, the black holes in the center, they change in brightness. So you can see those. Yeah. Especially yeah, over ten years. So. There is indeed one or two star-looking like objects in the ultra deep field that are quasars at a redshift of one and a half or so. And so those will not have moved. Of course, there's not enough of those for Anton to align his images with. So at some mm, point, you have yeah. to use galaxies to align the images, because you know they didn't move. And the quasars have a bit of a galaxy around them, too. It's quite faint. That's and right. It's usually drowned out. Yes. <laughs> quasars have a bit of a galaxy around them, too. <laughs> I like the way yeah. you said that. <laughs> <laughs> well, they do. You yeah. have to look very hard to find it sometimes, because the light from the quasar dominates over everything. And in fact, I'm working with Roger and a few other people on another program to do just that. But okay. I, I, I may, you raise an interesting point because the resolution of HST, I mean, you, have, you can work very carefully to line, you know, over 10 years to align um, those images, right, that were taken um, yeah. sometimes with different instruments. But when you go to other telescopes, you have to have some of those fiducial objects in the field so that you can make sure that when you see a weird X-ray, that you know in the Hubble image which object that is. So the alignment from not only from Hubble image to Hubble image, but also from different observatories to different observatories is really important. Yeah, they got all kinds of a lot of a lot of things to consider when you're adding these up. So, okay, I got to read this tweet. This is from Libby Doodle again. Thank you, by the way, for tweeting. I'm glad that someone is is tweeting us questions. She goes, "Whoa!" And you, this is this is so that we can uh, feel old. Um, <laughs> ultra deep field image was taken in 2006. That's when I graduated from high school. So, thank you for that. <laughs> Well, I love being uh, the youngest we were person we were the just show. we were just talking about this. We were talking about there are people like Libby who've lived in a world where there's always been the Hubble, and for us that's not been true, right? Well, so students what coming and starting their PhD theses now who were born after Hubble was born. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, it is. it's kind of crazy to think about. I mean, I I'm fairly young. I'm not young young, but I remember when Hubble Careful. came online. I'm fairly young. Yeah. I'm relatively young. My, the red shifting. Compared to what? Youngish. You don't red shift. You're not red shifted as much as some of us, right? right? Exactly. <laughs> but, I'm not wearing know. red today. <laughs> I may never wear it again. I, I agree. <laughs> What's your Z number? But <laughs> What's your point, Scott? But <laughs> what we're talking about is we're seeing new ways that Hubble is able to bring insight into what's going on. You know, we have frontier fields now, but now we're able to add 10 years of data. Take, you know, thinking about that, just 10 years of information to present what this tiny pocket of our observable universe is, that's wonderful. And then we're going to be able to add to it with James Webb, and we have all these other observatories. And we have now people that are born with these great space observatories already there. It's not a point where we've never had that. It's something that's there almost like the internet is. What What's the next generation going to be able to, to find out with these things that they're already born with, these tools already in hand? I think this is a great reason why we need to keep going on, you know, keep these science missions going on because new generations have this inspiration already handed to them and they can build newer things. Exactly, Scott and the tweeter. We need to keep the future generation in mind, right? This last month in May, Hubble uh, transpired its official five-year certified life after the surfacing mission of May 2009. Now, we're lucky many of these parts actually work a lot longer than five years, and we could well get another five or seven years out of it. But yeah. someday in the future, we will no longer have Hubble with us. This is a great time to remember that planning for the next big ultraviolet optical telescope after Hubble that would be launched after James Webb is something that really ought to start this decade. And the That's young right. generation needs to step up there. That's and an excellent point. 
And uh, there's a lot of hope that there will be some overlap between after JWST launches and Hubble will still be up and active and uh, taking data as well. So we'll have them both up at the same time. At least that's the hope. Quick comment from Rashawn Rubin. Uh, when will, this is from the Q&A app. When will we see a 3D map of the universe in a hologram form? I feel as if we're limited if we view and uh, perception perceive the universe in a 2D form. Uh, for example, from a computer screen or paper, and, and well, that's first a good step point. going on with with Gaia. Um, so that's our yes. first step in that direction, which is a billion star survey, which has faced some issues, but have been overcoming those issues uh, really well. And that's just happening now. I mean, I I'd like to see what if we're able to push that out further as far as galaxies go. Do we have any I, I way think of the, I think this lone, now? I think this lone digital sky survey for relatively nearby galaxies did something like that. Yeah. When they that started mapping out things in, as you said, the cosmic web. They have a lot of information about nearby galaxies uh, over a, not the whole sky, but a large part of the sky. And I think they did some sort of fly through. They did. They the did. ultra deep field, in fact, we did this as well. So for these galaxies in the ultra deep field, um, we know how far away most of them are. We've got spectroscopy, and you can, for the yeah, ones that don't have it, you can estimate it. Can and I so, share this with you? I yeah, have so, a so, render yes. engineer that does that for the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Where yeah, you see can... if you can put the movie up, because uh, it flies through, basically starting from the local galaxies in the Ultra Deep Field, sort of the bright foreground ones. And it goes for a couple of minutes, and it's available on the same website that you can get the Ultra Deep Field images from. And it, it goes after, after you fly through, you see as you go further back in time, the galaxies change their shapes. They, they tend to look different. And when you get to the very end of this video, the galaxies at that those early times look totally different from the normal ones. They don't look like spirals and ellipticals anymore. They kind of blobby and sort of funny looking galaxies. Yeah, so, so it's, it's I guess it could nice be fly said. So take a look at it. Take a look, basically like flying through the universe in 3D. Yeah, it's it is nice. And, and but the, but you know it, so it is possible. Uh, it, it is embedded within the data. We know how far away these things are in three dimensions. It's entirely possible to build a complete hologram you can stand inside of and project this if you want to. These are fly-throughs on a 2D surface. But there's nothing to prevent you at least from the data to be able to make a hologram or project this and even stand inside the ultra deep field or or uh, as uh, as Harry was saying the Sloan Digital Sky Survey was a ground-based survey located in New Mexico that did an enormous swath of the sky and was able to show all these galaxies also in 3D so we have the data to accurately represent the universe in three dimensions it just depends on what technology you want to uh, want to use to display that. Well, I so think, here's, I think a, here's a cool idea for OPPO. I think, why did you make like a, a 3D fly-through that even if you just display it on the computer yeah, screen... I agree. And Carol should glasses. print out the universe, too. She has a 3D printer, so we should get her to print out the universe for us. Yeah, I, I, was was I was afraid of that. <laughs> <laughs> right behind me, the 3D printer. <laughs> okay, 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 3D right fly right through. You can put yeah. on your 3D glasses. And, okay. uh, then you can yeah. see Harry... Okay. You said you had to go. By all, th I just want to take a moment and thank you very much for joining us today. This was an amazing image. Thank you for your work, and uh, as always, it's inspired a lot of people. So I want to thank you for showing for for going, and Absolutely. you can drop out at any time you need to. I know you got to go. So yeah, um, unfortunately, I, I had another commitment, but I, I wanted to say yeah, thank you for inviting you me to the hangout. Yeah, it's great. Thanks, so, Harry. So thank you thank very Harry. much. And in fact, we're uh, more or less out of. I think we're about out of time anyway. Um, but we'll start with one quick question from Daniel Nasato, also from the Q&A app. Will there be any plans to bring Hubble back to be put into a museum or science center, or is it destined to burn up in the atmosphere? Who wants to take that? That sounds like a Carol question. You don't want to? Well, I'd be then, happy to take it, but go ahead, Carol. Go ahead, okay, go ahead Roger. I mean, uh, go ahead, Roger. <laughs> well, Hubble is too big to live in orbit, right? If you just leave it there, it will eventually come down because of solar activity in the upper atmosphere, slowing it down, and then you have an uncontrolled re-entry where it might hit a city, and that's just a bad idea. And and so NASA has, in fact, in the last servicing mission, put on a grapple hook so that the robotic mission can grab it in the future um, sometime after 2025 and push it gently in the ocean. Okay. Um, there, there, there is an, also an alternative idea that um, 
some people would like to actually push it out further. So um, we'll see. Probably yep. it will be controlled reentry. Unfortunately, it, it would be will nice be in the if ocean. we could if we could go back once more and put a new suite of instruments in and push it out further. Yeah, that would be that, that awesome. That would be really nice. John Grunsfeld, I'll volunteer you for that. I'll volunteer for the service mission. I'll go up there. I'll volunteer my time for it. I'll, I'll, I'll right. go with you. All right. All right, Carol and I, we're going up to Hubble. Right. Fair enough. You guys later. <laughs> well, John, John, Grun John Grunsfeld made your job a little bit easier by uh, putting that little putting grab that grab ring on. on the bottom of it, so there's something right. to grab onto at least. We'll have our yeah. space carabiners and yeah. get on. <laughs> but Ro Roger, Roger's right is that the mirror itself is a, vi is a big object, and you don't want that. It's a, it is a liability. It is in the project plan. You know, when we put this stuff up there, we have to have a plan for how to quote unquote dispose of it. And the going in, the nominal plan is to bring bring it back, and then controlled reentry is what it's called. Yeah. Right. Okay, so I think that's it for this this uh, hangout. We're we're running out of time. I just want to respond real quick to Jason Carr, who is asking where can we find that a link to that 3D video. Uh, it was made in 2009. I will. It's on our. It's on Hubble site. Uh, Frank Summers made it uh, with uh, a lot of help from a lot of other people, and we. Uh, I'll I'll dig up the link. But if you go to hubblesite.org and you go to the press section and you do a search for Hubble uh, Deep Field in 3D, you'll see it should come up. But I'll also post a video a link. I'll put yeah. the links. I've already got it up here. I'll put links into YouTube and Google Plus right okay, now. Okay, there you go. Thank you, All right. thank you Scott. All, All right, right folks. Well, okay. I, that's it for this week, everybody. Thank okay. you for watching. Yeah. I'd like to. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, right. Thanks. for joining and Anton for joining us. Yep. Sure. And you on. <laughs> Everybody's dropping out like flies. On, on behalf of Carol and Scott Lewis, I'm Tony Darnell. Thank you all for watching, and as always, keep looking up. Bye. 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 Later. I don't get to press the stop broadcast button. <laughs>